our next speaker is Jory. All right, so Jory will be talking to us. Jory is from Data Eco. Um, she will be talking about using temporal and spatial dependencies to predict criminal activity, which sounds very, very interesting. Um, and she is a broadly trained data scientist at Data Eco with experience in neuroscience, healthcare, data um, and machine learning. Prior to joining Data Eco, she completed her PhD in Cognitive Neuroscience and MIT and worked as a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. Um, Jory currently resides in Paris when she builds predictive models and eats pain au chocolat. Hope I pronounced that properly. Bravo. All right, so um, welcome. Thank you. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. I, I am afraid I am losing my voice a little bit, so I apologize. Um, feel free to make gestures if, if we're losing track. Um, also, let me make sure that I know how to change my slides. Is this the right thing? Anybody on the tech booth? Try this one. Do I have slides? Try this one. Oh, oh. Oh, all right, superb. Um, so one thing to note, uh, which I apologize for, is we were originally slated to give a talk on deploying things to Docker swarms, but unfortunately uh, our Docker instance crashed and burned uh, just a few days ago. So we have a new topic, um, which is a project that I've been working on and I actually am quite excited about. Um, but in fair warning, we are switching a little bit more toward the data science side than the architecture side. So if you want to flee, feel free. Um, so as introduced, my name is Jory. I'm a data scientist at Data IQ. And I'm going to be talking through a project about predicting criminal activity um, in collaboration with the National Institute of Justice in the United States. So, oh, maybe it was a random chance that that worked. Excellent. All right, so, so why do we want to think about crime? Um, First of all, it is, it's an incredible social problem, actually. It's expensive, it's problematic, it costs the UK alone about $150 billion a year in prevention, in dealing with the outcomes, and in trying to do reparations for the people who suffer from crime. Uh, here's a map of a homicide across the UK, or rather across the EU, um, which people always find, you know, a little bit shocking. Um, in fair warning, I'm not going to be talking about homicides today. Um, I'll mostly be talking, in fact, about Grand Theft Auto. Um, so uh, why are we interested in trying to use data to handle crime? Um, in part because despite the immense social cost, uh, we actually know surprisingly little about what's driving crime. Looking at different reports, you see that crime rates are going up, crime rates are going down. Some reports map them onto certain kinds of causes, increased incarceration. Some reports map them onto other kinds of causes, uh, lack of social infrastructure. And so it's really hard to get a picture using snapshots of data or snapshots of analyses in terms of figuring out both when and where crime is likely to occur, and then maybe even more importantly, how can you actually effectively intervene on it. So uh, we, we can turn what, what is really a, a social or, or a financial challenge uh, into a technical challenge. So as I said, uh, traditional crime prediction uh, suffers from a couple of things. Uh, there's some really interesting work in criminology that often tries to get after just one or two factors. Um, you know, what is the effect of poverty on crime? What is the effect of different racial groups in a neighborhood on crime? Things like this. Um, but the problem with these analyses is that, first of all, they're on very small data sets. So the data that's actually collected in terms of number of crimes is relatively small. And the number of features that that group is looking at is, again, usually quite small and limited to relatively traditional statistical inference. Um, one particular thing that I want to highlight, because I think it's, it's one of the cool things we were able to do in this project, is that you can think about crime as both a spatial dimension, so how does crime distribute across a map, like we're looking at in the background here, or does, how does it move across time? And if you want to understand when and where crime is going to occur, you probably need to incorporate both of these factors. Is crime likely to occur more in this particular spot, on this particular day, or somewhere else? <clears throat> 
So unsurprisingly, um, because at this point it's 2017, people have tried to do criminal analysis with big data. And there's some actually super cool work that has come out of this. Uh, there's a really interesting work, uh, I believe, in the city of Chicago looking at Twitter data. So using just social media data, uh, a group found that way above chance they could predict uh, when and where criminal activity was going to occur. Uh, and there's been a couple other studies of similar features. Um, but again, there's a couple of things that I think in part because we're relatively new to doing very specific kinds of predictions, such as criminology, that are lacking at the moment. Uh, one is that the techniques that are being used are very, very general. So, you know, very standard social media analyses, analyses were uh, done for this kind of thing. And so often the techniques that criminology ha have used or ways of sort of leveraging specific structure in the data aren't yet being applied to sort of classic big data approaches. Um, and second, again, a sort of a specific thing to highlight here is that um, many uh, communities have developed very specific statistical techniques to deal with both spatial and temporal data. Um, and one of the reasons you might want to do that is you actually get really interesting interdependencies. So if you look at one point in a map, it's not an independent sample of the point next door. And similarly, if you look at Wednesday, it's not really an independent sample from what happened the Tuesday or the day before. Um, and so one of the things that I was really interested in is say, well, can we start to use more specific uh, statistical techniques in combination with very large scale data to do criminal prediction? So the goals of the project that I'm going to tell you about uh, are first that we used entirely open source data. So everything that I'm going to talk about here you can find on the web, which is kind of cool. Uh, second is I'm going to talk through how we did some feature engineering, uh, trying to leverage this internal structure that I'm talking about. Um, using some targeted statistical techniques, so specifically time series and Krieging to handle our temporal and spatial features. Uh, we're going to try and model and predict crime, and then we're going to dig in to try and understand a little bit what's underlying the predictions in our model. So what data do we have? Uh, the core data set that we got, and this was uh, released by the National Institute of Justice, who was running this project, um, is uh, criminology records from the city of Portland, Oregon, in the United States. Um, there's nothing particularly interesting about Portland other than that the police department agreed to cooperate on this particular project. Um, but it's worth noting it's a mid-sized city. It has very sort of standard demographic makeup. So in some ways, it's actually a pretty good city to take as a starting point of a model of the kinds of things that we might want to do expanding out to other cities um, or other places where crime is occurring. So what were the actual data? Uh, the data consisted of calls for service. So um, I actually don't know what the number is here in the UK. In the US, it's 911 calls, so it's, it's calls for emergency service. Um, and it's worth thinking about, um, and we can get back to this, that this isn't exactly the same as when crimes were occurred. So it's 911 calls that the police then validated were worth following up on. Um, but we can think about what kind of biases are built into the data. So uh, for every call for service, it's time stamped uh, with a specific uh, location and a time. So for example, the map that you see here is the screenshot of a single day. These were the 911 calls that came in at that particular point in time. Um, in terms of uh, the processing that I'm overall going to talk through, uh, as I said, we're going to get through some time series, um, some Krieging, some dimensionality reduction, and then thinking about how to combine all of these different features together. Uh, the tool that I used for much of this uh, is Dataiku's Data Science Studio. Um, so we are a platform in which you can do all the different kinds of coding. Uh, for this project, um, one thing that was very relevant about it is that I used SQL, I used Python, I used R. Um, and it was very nice to be able to move back and forth between these languages to optimize the things that each of those were good at. Um, happy to talk about that more, but we're actually going to talk about data science overall. So, Digging into what our call for service data was, um, we had three different types of data. So we had street crimes, burglary, and motor vehicle thefts. Uh, we had overall about a million unique calls um, from uh, five years worth of data. Um, and we can sort of think about these structurally as uh, geopoints by time by call features. And the reason I'm going to start laying this out is we're going to deal with data that sits in a lot of different dimensions and in a lot of different frames. And one of the challenges, I think, when you're going to combine a lot of different data sources is starting to generalize, OK, what is the structure here? What am I going to be able to combine my data on? What are my indexes? So we can think of this as geopoints, times, and, and then the features of interest. 
The second thing that we added to this was points of interest using OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap.org is a great open source resource if you're interested in doing any kind of geographical analysis. Uh, it looks a lot like Google Maps, and users have tagged all sorts of different features, everything from bus stops to post office boxes to movie theaters to restaurants. And so you can really get a sense of what the geographical space looks like in terms of infrastructure. Uh, from a snapshot of 2016, uh, we were able to pull about 10,000 points of interest. Um, and for this, we were able to think about what we have is a static snapshot of geo points, so very punctate points on the map, indexed by the various features, uh, including things like category labels, um, some information about use, etc. Uh, the next bit of data that we were able to pull in uh, was uh, some data that we're trying to use to get a sense of how people are using that infrastructure that we got from OpenStreetMaps. So uh, using the Foursquare public API, which again is actually a really nice resource, uh, we were able to get about 35,000 check-ins. So if you haven't used Foursquare, the way it works is you show up to a location and you push a button on your phone and it records the fact that you were there. And you can add different amounts of information. You can say, I just had dinner. This is how much I paid for it. I'm with these friends, et cetera. So uh, what we did, uh, what we got from the API in particular was the latitude and longitude of each check-in, the category of the business, and then a few additional pieces of information that users sometimes shared. For example, the size of their group or the amount of money that they spent at that particular location. The next thing that we added uh, was something that we got from the website of the Portland uh, Police Department, which was the police precincts themselves. So you might imagine that uh, which district you're in changes the way that criminal activity is handled. Um, so it seemed like a really simple way to think about our map a little bit. Um, and so at this point, we now have added kind of a slightly different geographical feature, which is a geotile. So you can think of this as you know, a continuous chunk with edges, and then that chunk, uh, again, has some category features to it, what precinct it belongs to, how many policemen there are, et cetera. The final bit, no, not, that's not true. Another bit, I, I promise I will end with the data at some point. Uh, the next bit of data that we added uh, was uh, information from the U.S. Census. So the U.S. Census runs a query depending on location every one to four years, um, and they get an immense amount of information. So they will ask a household to report on everything from the number of dogs, the number of children, the number of toilets, the number of cars, the number of bedrooms, to things like their income level, how long it takes them to get to work, whether or not everyone is employed, the age range. So you get a very, very detailed snapshot of of who is living in a household and the kind of lifestyle that they have. Um, of course, the census doesn't make all of that publicly available, but what it does do is it aggregates actually a, a surprisingly fine scale. So each of these tiny little uh, blocks with, with the much finer grain uh, black line there um, is, is the level that you can get this data. So you can get a pretty good snapshot of all of this data at about the scale of a neighborhood or a city block. Um, so in terms of trying to paint a snapshot of who is living in these places, um, you, you can do something quite interesting. So we've, we've added to our data pile now um, some more geotiles. So again, they're kind of these continuous chunks with edges. Um, and this time we've indexed by year. So we were able to get three years worth of census data. Um, and then we have all of the census features of which there are about 20,000. So we've added a lot of data. Um, the second to last bit of data that we included was uh, the weather data. So uh, this is the, the first thing that we moved in terms of trying to get something that was purely temporal and a little bit more fine-grained. Uh, so using uh, the NOAA weather API, again, super cool in our face, highly recommend it, uh, you can get a lot of different weather information. So we got daily samples for the same range uh, as the data that we had crime data for. And we were able to get things like temperature, amount of rain, wind speed, min and max, all, a whole bunch of different features about the weather conditions. Finally, promise, the last little bit of data that we added in was another temporal feature, although one that was much more punctate, um, which is we were interested in adding political events um, and, and sort of social events that maybe were of interest. So we were able to grab 
um, mostly from public online calendars and a couple of newspapers, listings of different things that happened in the city. Um, in part because it seemed like those might drive crime, and in part because those are probably unusual events. And if we're trying to do some time series modeling, it's nice to be able to say, well, which points are not like the rest of them? This Wednesday was special because it was the day before election, things like that. So just to put it all on, on one page, uh, what we're working with is um, our target data, so past crime. We're hoping to use that to predict future crime. Uh, and we supplemented that with uh, event data, with weather data, with police precincts, with points of interest, with social media data from Foursquare, and US Census data. So how the heck do you make this very large pile of data useful? It's great to have big data. It's great to have very featured. Uh, you need to do something relatively uh, clever with it. So uh, we broke it down into a couple of different steps. The first thing was to think about, all right, how do we handle just the data that has a temporal component? Um, which is to say, how can you use things like past crime and maybe events to model what might happen in the future, assuming those same kinds of temporal regularities held? Uh, and so for that, uh, we, you, know, you can look. So this is just a plot, actually, of crime uh, over time. So this is a plot of the raw data averaged across the city. Um, and what you can see is there's clearly some temporal regularity there. And so the core concept behind doing time series modeling and then time series forecasting is to break apart these regularities, uh, figure out what the underlying trends are, and then put them back together. Uh, so what we did is we used Facebook's profit model, uh, which is an implementation uh, built-in stand of a basically fancy ARIMA. So it's a way of doing different kinds of linear decomposition of your sig signal, um, and then, as I said, putting them back together. Um, we used an implementation in Python. There's also an implementation in R, and they might support a couple other ones at this point. Uh, it's a very friendly interface and fun to play with. So what you can do is you can take that raw data that had kind of that temporal regularity, and you can break it up into a handful of different components. And this is what we got. So what you can see is, OK, so what's the change overall across our data? It looks like crime went up into 2016, then maybe it ticked down a little bit. So we have a really global trend that we can use to forecast into 2016. Then we were able to scale down and say, OK, what's the effect of just those holidays we put in? So one of the cool things about uh, different kinds of time series models and the profit implementation in particular is that you can use basically as, as impulse regressors or as single points in time all of your holiday tags. So we included those data and we could say, OK, what are the effects of these special days that are different than these kinds of overall regularities? Um, and what you'll notice, for example, it's hard to see there, but there, there's a point that goes way down. That's Christmas. It turns out that in Portland, nobody commits crime on Christmas. OK. So uh, the, the next element that we got in our forecasting model was uh, a day of the week. So the third one you see there, I think the text is a little small, sorry, um, is just walking you through Monday through Sunday. And you can see that it looks like Friday is like not a great day for crime. Um, so be careful on Fridays. Um, and then finally, the, the last component we had is over the course of a year. So what is the general trend month to month? Um, and so what's cool about this kind of approach is since we were able to pull out these different signals, hopefully mostly discarding noise, then we can build them back together to do something like this. So we have a fit now to our data. It, it's obviously a pretty good fit. And then we can forecast that forward saying, OK, what do, what do we think based on, on history is going to happen in the next handful of weeks or months? So that was step one, is, is time series forecasting, which is how we handled our, our temporal features, the past crime and the event data. Um, one thing that's worth noting is that what I showed you guys as a sample uh, was actually averaged across the entire city of Portland. Um, but if you remember, what we're interested in is doing this also at a geographical level. So the way we actually did it is we broke up our city into very small chunks. We used the census chunks. And for each one of those chunks, uh, we did an independent forecast. So we've already kind of turned our time series data into something that's a little bit geographical. So we can say, all right, so we have a geotile. And then we have an estimate of how that geotile is going to behave in the future based on, on the past data of that particular point in space. So now that we've dealt with our temporal features, uh, how do we want to handle our spatial features? So 
Uh, one of the things that, that is an interesting challenge with dealing with much of the geographical data we had is that it was sampled at, at very punctate points in space. Crime happened at a specific latitude and longitude. Movie theaters exist at a specific latitude and longitude. Um, and given that both you can sample that really at an infinitely fine scale, and that it's very hard to figure out how to think about points that are next to each other, we needed some way of moving from a punctate space to a relatively more continuous space. Because I don't want to make predictions just about these specific latitude and longitude points, I want to be able to make predictions about points that we don't have any data on at all. So um, this time, uh, using some packages in R, um, which are specifically designed for geostatistics. Uh, in fact, the original use case was often in mining, so people developed these features because you would take uh, core samples, for example, if you're mining for gold uh, at various points, and you want to be able to figure out from those samples where should I dig next to find the deepest point of gold, um, even though you, you don't actually ha have data from that particular point. So we decided to apply these kinds of techniques to all of our punctate spatial data. Um, so we use two, two packages, uh, which again I recommend checking out if, if this is the kind of data that you work with. Uh, one is the GSTAT package and one is the SP package. Um, and, and what they do is, is they implement uh, what is called a, a Gaussian process regression, or Kriegin, who was named for the guy who applied this to geostatistics. Um, and basically the idea here is it's just a slightly more sophisticated interpolation. So what you can say is for every one of these pair of points, you can ask, uh, what is the effect of the distance on the shared variance? So there's a certain point almost always that if you get far enough away, you no longer influence your neighbors. But if you're closer together, then maybe there's some reason to think that you guys are a little bit more similar. So that's kind of the idea with gold, for example. If you go way across the field, it really doesn't matter for this point how much gold was over here. But if you look right next to it, eh, there's probably going to be some amount of gold that's relevant to, to what you actually sampled. So this is a way of estimating what that shared variance is or what that distance point is. And then what's cool is from this curve, you can actually fit across a map something that gives you an overall estimate of the effect or sort of the, in this case, the criminalness or the movie theaterness of every single point in your geographical space, even though you don't actually have the data um, you know, that, that you've measured. So, oh, so we were able to do that for um, all of our different purely geographical features. So we moved from punctate points in space to now continuous maps, which gives us a little bit more power to, to make new inferences. Uh, the final step uh, that I had to do in terms of feature engineering or processing was to do dimensionality reduction. So uh, we've, you know, one of the great things about having a lot of data is you have a lot of data, um, but you also need some way of handling all of those features and figuring out what's going to be important. So in particular for the census data, um, as I said, we had about 20,000 features. That's just too many to handle. And in fact, many of those are quite correlated. You know, the, the number of cars you have correlates with you know, the garage size you have, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, they often ask many different versions of the same kind of question. So uh, the way we did this is um, for each census block, so again, we're doing this uh, at, at sort of the geographical scale, um, we first just did feature selection. So we were interested, remember, in crime. So we correlated each of our census features against the amount of crime across geography. So. Each point is a geographical point. We flattened that out, and we got correlations, just trying to get things that at least seem to track a little bit with our variable of interest. Uh, so then uh, we did this uh, independently for each one of our census years, so 2013, 2014, 2015. Uh, from that, uh, you know, just iterated correlation, we took the features that were the most reliably correlated with our target. Um, we took the top 5% from each year, um, and then, uh, so, so, so at this point, you know, we have about 5% of, of the features we could all have. Hopefully, hopefully there's some reliability across years. Um, but, but one thing that's a huge problem with this approach is that even though we have features that are hopefully predictive, we also have features that all, all probably say kind of similar things, at least some of them do, um, because we selected for correlated features. So how do you handle that? Uh, you do dimensionality reduction on top of that. So in this case, uh, we did principal components analysis. The idea behind principal components analysis is that you take uh, a cloud of data that looks like this, and you say, okay, what are sort of the, the fewest number of dimensions that I can give you that more or less will reconstruct the shape? 
So if you have a cloud that looks like this oval, actually, even if you just draw the first line, you do sort of the longer line at the diagonal, you do a pretty good job of capturing your data. You could say this point is there on that arrow, and that gives you a reasonable amount of information about the data. And then you could continue to build it out and say, oh, well, let me add another point that explains a little bit more variance until you reach a point that you find satisfying in terms of your data. Um, so we did this. Uh, we explained, uh, we tried to explain 75% of our variance. Um, we played around with it a little bit uh, in cross-validation that seemed to work the best. Um, and then we took our top five principal components, and then we also just took our top five regressors um, in case there was information there that was particularly useful. So uh, just to recap a little bit more, because I'm giving a lot of information. Um, so we took our temporal data, uh, we did time series forecasting on that. So now what we have is geo points by forecasted crime. The weather data we didn't have to do anything with because it's just a time series already. Um, the police precincts, same thing, they were well behaved. Our points of interest, our four square data, uh, we turned from these punctate points into these continuous maps. And then our census data, we did a lot of work to try and reduce that down to a relatively coherent feature space. So, final step in terms of data wrangling, and then I promise I will stop talking about all of these different kinds of data and get on to the modeling, uh, is geohashing. So geohashing is actually an incredibly simple concept. It's just the idea that you drop a grid on top of a map, and then you aggregate you know, with whatever your favorite function is, let's take the average, the information that's inside that grid. Um, so, you know, statistically, it, it's not very interesting. Um, it's computationally a little bit heavy, um, so one of the things that's actually quite nice is that uh, in uh, PostgreSQL, SQL, um, there's a whole implementation to deal with geographic data called PostGs, um, which is, is a superb implementation. So if you're working in SQL, I recommend uh, moving to PostGs if you want to do all kinds of cool combinations of geographical features. It can do intersections and averaging and hashing um, in, in ways that make what is otherwise heavy computing actually pretty easy. So, our final step was to drop this very fine grid, so it's a little bit goofy in its representation here, but you can see the pink and the purple squares, those are just alternating, so it's quite fine. Um, and we were able to drop that across every single map that we had. So we now have super fine geographical points, which allow us to compare any of the very dis disparate kinds of data we have at any given point on our map. So. Uh, you can now just sort of think about the data set that we were able to build from all of this. So it, it obviously took some work and a lot of talking, um, but at the end of the day, what we had is a single data set that consisted of all of this data, which was uh, something that is indexed by geo point and by time. So for every one of these little hashes, uh, we had a day from 2012 to 2017, um, and then for each one of those indexed points by space and time, we had all of the features that we built out, including who's used it, how many people live there, all of the things that we built into our model. Um, so what we ended up with was about 4.6 million records uh, with 61 features, including our criminal statistics, our weather features, points of interest, public use, et cetera. Uh, just to give you a sense, this is what the correlation matrix looked like of our data. Um, so you can see there's, there's definitely still mutual information that's happening here. Um, hopefully it's the case that some of that is predictive. Um, so what we did next is uh, we did some modeling on the data. So I think the only thing that is, is really worth noting, uh, especially for the sake of time, is that when you are doing cross-validation with temporal data, uh, you have to be a little bit thoughtful about it, right? So we always want to cross-validate our data uh, to make sure that you're not overfitting your model. But if you randomly split temporal data, some of your folds will be using the future to predict the past. So when you are doing cross-validation with temporal data, you have to do kind of a clever sliding window, such that you are only using ever past data to train on and future data to test on. Um, so just worth noting, and was something that until I was working with this kind of time series data and also doing more classic machine learning, I hadn't really thought about. Um, but indeed, we used a handful of different models, uh, a random forest, an XG boost, and a couple linear regressions. Um, and what we found is, um, first of all, the, the random forest overall did the best. Um, so we had, had a, an R-square of about 0.5 uh, overall. In fact, if you zoom into some of the more specifics, um, we, we did a little bit better than that. Um, so 
in, in slightly you know, cheating disclosure because I wrote these slides before we found out. Uh, we actually won the competition with the NIJ for a couple of different categories. Um, we performed best with Grand Theft Auto, as maybe I mentioned. Um, and in that space, we were actually able to get predictive accuracy on real crime data of around 0.85, which, which is, is actually pretty powerful when you're dealing with something as noisy as when and where a crime is going to occur. So, so we were pretty excited about that. Um, on sort of the more statistical side, uh, we also thought about how do you validate a complex model like this. Um, so we ran different versions of the model that had uh, didn't have all of the feature processing we did, so we just threw in the raw spatial and the raw temporal features, because maybe it was better to not do all of the statistical inference. Uh, we looked at the model by dropping both the spatial and the temporal features independently. And then we also compared it to just a lag model and say, well, let's just imagine that what happens this week is basically the same thing that happened last week. And we did that at a bunch of different scales. Um, so this model performed better statistically, you know, sort of on, on data that we'd already collected on our test data uh, than any of those slightly more simple models, um, which at least hopefully suggests that there's, there's good reason to have gone through all of this rigmarole to begin with. Um, the, the thing that, that, that I found quite interesting then was, was to zoom in a little bit onto what was driving this model. So uh, these were our top features. Um, so we had things like the number of shops. Uh, we had our top principal components, which you can look at here. Um, we had social media check-ins. We had poverty status. Um, we had things like houses with no vehicle available, uh, service stores and food places. So, so you can see it's kind of an interesting mix of features. Um, and, and many of them, in fact, seem to be like very socially relevant indicators. They're the kinds of things that criminologists like to talk about. They're the kinds of things that people are interested in running studies on. One thing that's worth noting is with a random forest, uh, you don't know which direction these features uh, influence your model. So we don't know whether uh, more stores mean that there's more crime or less crime. Um, so the way that I tried to get that back a little bit was to just do a correlation between each of my top features, my, my important features, and the actual variable, which was crime. Um, so that's not the same information that goes into the model, but it can kind of give you a sense of probably which direction it's pushing it. So uh, ranked in order from uh, most predictive of crime, uh, most positively predictive of crime, to most negatively predictive of crime, um, you can start to see that it's, it's painting a picture of, OK, what kind of regions seem to be supporting criminal activity? What kind of features should we intervene on if we want to start making policy decisions that can change the way crime is happening? Um, you know, in talking with the National Institute of Justice, it's been really interesting because one of the things they're looking at is it seems like communities that don't have a lot of social support, so communities that are transients, communities that have to travel very long distances to work, communities that are underemployed, these tend to be the communities that have the least good policing and also the most criminal activity. And so thinking about, okay, so these are the kinds of indicators we probably need to intervene on. Um, to me, it starts to be maybe more of an interesting question than just saying, well, Wednesday night in this particular neighborhood, you should have more police there. So I think that what's cool about this kind of model is you can walk back and forth between those. Um, this, just to show, is, is the actual kind of prediction we were able to make. So we generated a map across space um, where the, you know, the hotter the image, the, the more likely we thought there would be crime. And again, we did this for a bunch of different windows um, this was on the scale of two weeks. We did everything from a day up to, I believe, three months was our kind of maximum aggregation window. So uh, in summary, I walked you guys through a lot of open source data. I hopefully talked about a couple of different techniques for handling um, data that I think is kind of internally complicated uh, and some ways that you can think about combining very heterogeneous sets of data. Uh, we talked a little bit about how you handle massive data sets with dimensionality reduction, how you can merge those together using different kinds of indexes, um, and in the end, think about, okay, what kind of data predictions can you actually make? So, uh, in summary, I think that uh, there's a couple things that I learned from this project. Um, one is you can do really cool things with open source data, uh, which I just think is fun. Um, and that I do think it is important that the machine learning AI community starts to be a little bit more thoughtful about incorporating traditional statistic techniques, you know, as well as just per se machine learning. The fact that we could leverage these spatial and temporal features really gave us a leg up. Um, and I think it's cool as the community starts to get more and more active in this. Um, so keep a diverse set of tools in your, your data science toolbox. Um, and, and maybe being able to use these kinds of targeted analyses uh, will change a little bit the way you're doing data science.
Um, so thank you very much. Thanks to my collaborators who worked on this project and helped us be here. And of course, thanks to Big Data Week for uh, hosting an excellent event. And thank you to you guys for listening to me for slightly over time. Thank you. Thanks, it was very, very interesting. Thanks. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Hi, Joey. Thank you. Um, I'm very glad your Docker Swarm went down because this week on my master's course, we are attempting to build a predictive crime model uh, with some open source data for Philadelphia in R. Oh, fancy that. Uh, so oh. you've pretty much done it for me there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so two things. How long did this take you guys? Um, and what are you doing with it? Is it a commercial proposition? And how much of it is reusable for other police forces, et cetera? So um, in terms of time, I, there were three of us who were working on the project. Um, and I'd say we did it in chunks, so it's a little hard to estimate. But I think it maybe took a month or two of like pretty dedicated work hours. Um, so uh, yeah, it was definitely, you know, there was a lot of da data wrangling and modeling and so on. Um, and then in terms of sort of the open source or the reusability, um, we're still talking with the NIJ about, you know, kind of what they want to do with it. Um, so, you know, they are the, the intellectual owners of the code base at the moment. Um, but we're also writing a couple of blog posts that are going to include some code snippets and so on, and those are going to be publicly shared. Um, and, and probably it's the case that we're going to put it onto GitHub for a public repository. Um, so, so we're definitely excited to you know, work with other criminal groups. Um, I am very interested to see how this model generalizes. So you know, if you look at you know, countries that have really different makeups in terms of you know, cr you know, criminal structure, so you know, the kinds of crimes committed or where they're, 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 where they're committed, um, or just the demographic makeup. Um, I'm curious if this model can capture those differences or if you really need to kind of start from scratch for, for every different place. So, so to me, that's interesting and I don't know yet. Good luck with your project. Any other questions? Oh, there's someone in the back. I think that's, okay. Just Um, so, uh, Random Forest, purely for performance reasons, um, it just outperformed the other algorithms that we played with. Um, I think it had the advantage of dealing relatively well with correlated variables, because even though we did our dimensionality reduction, as you saw in our heat map, like we definitely didn't have perfectly orthogonal predictors. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that was one of the reasons it did a little bit better than at least our linear models. Um, and for this, we actually used MLlib. Um, because it was a little bit nicer for dealing with the large data sets. Um, but uh, I played with it in Python, and you get similar performance uh, just using the scikit-learn implementation. And then we Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yep. And the last question. No, we're good. All right. Thank All you, right. guys. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>